Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all out this evening. It's good to be able to meet with you and good to be able to see you again uh, as we meet at this time for our prayer meeting. We're just going to open our meeting uh, in a word of prayer, so let's all pray. Dear Lord and our loving Heavenly Father, we do just thank you once again, Lord, for the opportunity of being able to gather together here this evening, Lord. We do just thank you for the blessing that it is of being able to fellowship face to face, one with another, Lord. We do realize over the time that we've had away, Lord, uh, the privilege that it is to be able to be here, Lord. We do thank you that you have opened the doors once again, Lord. We do thank you that we are uh, gathered here because you are here with us, Lord, and to bless us. And we do just pray, Lord, that as we meet this evening, that you will uh, lead and guide and bless each and every one of us, Lord. We do thank you for the way in which you've sustained us and helped us, Lord. We do thank you for the blessing it's been to be able to do online services and all of these different things, Lord, that have been such a blessing. We do thank you for um, all of these different methods and ways in which you have provided for us to be able to continue to spread your word, Lord. We do thank you for the drive-in services that have been taking place here, Lord. We do thank you for those who have tuned in online and have seen them, Lord. Uh, and we do just pray, Lord, knowing uh, that your word will not return unto you void, Lord. And we do thank you that uh, as your word has gone out, Lord, that it has touched hearts, that it has touched lives, Lord. We do thank you for the many stories that we have heard, Lord, of people asking questions, people coming to know you, Lord, as their own and personal saviour, Lord. We do thank you for uh, the Holiday Bible Club that has taken place this week online, Lord. We do thank you for the little girl that was saved at the previous Holiday Bible Club, Lord. And we do just pray that you will uh, continue to bless that work and we will hear of other young ones coming to know you, Lord, through the work that you have given them to do, Lord. We do just pray, Lord, that as we meet here tonight, we do just pray, Lord, that you will help us to focus our minds upon you. We do just pray, Lord, that you'll take away any thought of anything else outside of this place, Lord, and that you will help us to focus on you, on your word, Lord. We do just pray that you will speak through us. We do just pray that you will help us, that you will guide us, that you will lead us here this evening, Lord, and that we will go away from this place knowing that we have met with you and that you have blessed us, Lord, each and every one. For we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Now, as we said at the start of the service, thank you so much for having us. And we do thank your session and your minister for inviting us along. Uh, I know that I've been here quite a few times now um, to do deputation meetings and to preach here in different circumstances. And it's always a, a privilege to be able to see you and to be able to gather with you. The last time I was in this pulpit was for your uh, youth service. And it was a little bit more full at that point, but it was it's just as nerve-wracking being up here now in this giant pulpit. Um, but it's, it's a pleasure just to be able to spend time with you and also to update you uh, a little bit on the work that we are involved in, a little bit about what's been going on. Uh, a lot of the questions that we were asked, uh, especially during the time of lockdown, is the have mission organizations just all gone on furlough and, and aren't doing anything anymore. Um, so it's nice to be able to have this opportunity. Um, I was saying just to a few people at the beginning of the service that since services have gone back to some form of normality now and we're meeting back in buildings, uh, a lot of the ministers have now gone on holidays. So it means August is a, a very busy time for me and I've been uh, here, there and everywhere. And it's uh, nice to be able to gather with people and it's nice to be able to just encourage us and let you know a little bit about what God's been doing uh, through different organizations, through different ways and means, uh, Jordan. Art. I think one of the things that you may have realized yourself, uh, and I know I definitely realized Jordan lockdown, was that I think like everybody, when things started to very, very quickly change and, and everything was very dramatic and all the churches closed and all these different things were going on, uh, missionaries were having to return home within our own denomination and further afield, as you've heard this evening. I think we all had that feeling of, well, what's going to happen? What, what is going to go on? Like our churches are going to be closed. We're going to have to maybe go online and, and all these different things. Everything was kind of up in the air. And we kind of look back on that six months later and it's been, uh, there's been a lot of trials. There's been a lot of hardship, but it's been amazing to see how God has worked in these situations and how God has moved uh, and the things that have happened that maybe would have never have happened uh, had this not taken place. Um, and it's just amazing to, to know that in the midst of so much uncertainty and in the midst of so much trouble and so much panic and so much fear to a certain degree, we know that, that God isn't shocked by any of this, that God wasn't surprised that this happened. And, and yet we've seen how it worked for his plans 
and his purposes as things went forward and, and his word continued to be spread. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that, Alan. Uh, and I just want to add my personal thanks to you. Uh, I know that quite a lot of you um, pray for the work, support the work, support me personally. Um, so I do just want to thank you for the words of encouragement that you sent me and all of these different things. And I do really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate your support and prayers uh, as a church as well. Now I'm going to finish just by looking briefly at the book of Joel. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, we're just going to turn to the book of Joel there in the Minor Prophets, just after Hosea, uh, and we're just going to read the first chapter uh, of the book of Joel. It's not a very big book. It's only three chapters long, so hopefully you should be able to find it there. It's only a couple of pages. We always had a song that we learned. I remember when I was in Sunday school, I always learned the song to remember all the books of the Bible. But for some reason, we always skipped over the minor prophets. I could never remember them all. And it used to sort of go, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Malachi. And we never ever remembered the ones in the middle. Um, so it was always an interesting one to be able to go through. And during lockdown, I spent a lot of time looking at some of these minor prophets. Um, so we're just going to read the first chapter here of Joel chapter 1. It says this. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm have left, the locust eaten, and that which the locusts have left, the canker worm have eaten, and that which the canker worm have left, the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean, bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up and the oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up and the fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourself and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withheld from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed is rotten under their clods, the garners are laid desolate, the barns are broken down, the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture, yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of water are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. We'll just finish there at the end uh, of chapter 1. Let's just bow on a brief word of prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you for your word. We do thank you that your word is unchangeable, Lord. We do thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. We do thank you that your word cannot be stopped. We do thank you, Lord, that it will go on and on until your word is accomplished and completed, Lord. We do just thank you for how we have seen your word go forth, even in the midst of a time when we didn't know how anything was going to carry on, Lord. We do thank you that your word remained the same. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to read it and understand it for ourselves, Lord. We have heard this evening of so many people that have no water, that have no food, that don't have the Bible in their own language, Lord. We do thank you, Lord, that we have your word in our own tongue. We do thank you, Lord, that we have books that we can read to better understand it. 
And we do thank you, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to be able to look at it together, to be able to learn, Lord, and to be able to gather together and sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron. We do just pray now, Lord, as we have your word open in front of us, we do just pray uh, that you will bless us, that you will help us, that you will challenge us, Lord. We do just pray that anything that is said this evening will come from you and not from me, Lord. And if it is from me, we do pray that you will take it out of our minds before we leave this place so that you may be honored and you may be glorified through this, Lord. Challenge us, bless us, help us to focus on this word and to look at ourselves and our walk with you, Lord. And we do just pray that you will draw us closer to yourself, for we ask it in your name. Amen. I don't know how many of you read uh, the book National Geographic. Um, there's a girl in our work, Becky, and she's really, really into it, and she reads in that older National Geographic uh, magazines that come out. Um, but I was looking through some of them, and there was a, an edition of National Geographic in May 1984, and it was one of the first ones that they showed in full colour. And at the front of that magazine in the National Geographic in 1984, they showed photographs and drawings of the destruction that wiped out the Roman cities of Pompeii and Herculeum in AD 79. The explosion of Mount Vesuvius. Now this explosion was so sudden that the residents were killed while in the middle of their daily routines. Men and women were at the market. The rich were in luxurious baths slaves working in homes. They died in the middle of volcanic ash and superheated gases. Even family pets suffered the same quick and final fate. And it takes very little imagination to picture the panic that would have taken place on that day. The saddest part that they spoke about in National Geographic about this eruption of Mount Vesuvius and these people that died on the spot was that they didn't have to die. Scientists confirmed years later what ancient Romans writers had recorded at that particular time. Weeks of rumblings and shakings came before the actual explosion. An ominous plume of smoke from the mountain was clearly visible for days before the volcano actually erupted. And it said at the end of the magazine, at the end of this article, it said, if only they had read the signs and heeded the warnings. Now in the world that we live in today, we see very similar things. We only have to look at the, the year that we are currently living in, in the middle of it, to see different things that have occurred and different things that have happened throughout this year. But we go back even further than that, and we see so many things that go on, that have gone on throughout our lives. Warfare, economic troubles, famine, breakdown in family values, hatred towards the things of God. All of these things point towards a coming day of judgment because God warns us of these things. He warns us of these different rumblings that will take place. Famine, wars, economic instability, people turning their backs on God, people doing what is right in their own eyes. He talks about all of these things in his word. All of these things point to this coming judgment. And just like Joel in his day, we are called to be people who go out and proclaim truth, who warn people of a coming day, and who warn people of how they can escape hell. In Joel's day, so just to give you a little bit of a um, background into what's going on here, Joel's day, in the time that he is living there, the land is being plagued by locusts. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I've ever read about a, a plague of locusts in the Bible, it seems very biblical. It's a very biblical thing that happens, a big plague of locusts, and we can't imagine it happening in our time. But yeah, one of the things that we've seen even earlier this year, if you think back to pre-COVID, was in uh, Kenya. They had a plague of locusts that took place, uh, coming and eating their crops uh, and causing all sorts of havoc uh, at that particular time. And if you can remember that, and if you can remember that being on the news earlier this year, it'll give you a little bit of an idea of what we are talking about. Joel's land that he lived in was being plagued by locusts. The locust disrupted the local economy of the country it was a big farming community. A lot of people worked in the fields. They had cows, they had sheep, they had uh, all sorts of different plants and food growing. All of these different things that Joel had mentioned there in chapter one. And these locusts had started to disrupt the local economy, which as you can imagine, affected every single level of society. God called Joel and showed him that it was his judgment upon the nations and how he needed to tell people about their need to repent. After that, God would come and move in a fresh way through the land. 
And that's what was going on at that particular time. And it brings us to just a couple of points that I'm going to bring up just as we start to head towards our time of prayer. And my first point is this, is that the day of the Lord is foreshadowed by natural disaster. And we read that right the way throughout the Bible. We read it in numerous points that Jesus spoke about during the Gospels uh, and also in Revelation as well. It is mentioned at a number of times. And we read it here in Joel chapter 1. We get a very direct picture of what is going on at that time. Swarms of locusts invading the nation, attacking the city. Disaster is fallen on Judah and the crops are wiped out. We see it there in verse 6 uh, down to verse 10. Uh, where it says, for the nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number. He says that these plague of locusts is like an army that is attacking this land, an army that is without number, whose teeth are like the teeth of a lion and they have the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches therefore are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut from the house of the Lord and the priests of the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up and the oil languisheth. Joel takes this opportunity in the midst of so much fear, so much destruction, so much sadness that is going on in that particular land. And he takes the opportunity to share with the people about how this is a bad situation and about this, how this is God's judgment on sin, but also that it pales in comparison to the far more terrible judgment day that is to come, the day of the Lord. And we see him saying that in verse 15, that he says, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. One of the things that we see in our society is that when death or disaster occurs, it forces people to question about what life's really all about. We've seen no bigger example of that than over the past number of months in online services uh, that were tuned into in far greater number than ever before. People looking for answers to questions about life when faced to see the frailty of it. And we've seen that in so many different situations. I run the, the Facebook page for our church, for Barna Hinch, uh, and we had a number of people get in touch with us um, during our meetings and during the online services, people that contacted us asking questions about why is, why is God letting this happen? What is going to happen to my family? What, what is going to happen to me if I die? And we've seen that happening to such a great extent that when people are faced with the frailty of life, it makes them start to think and start to question things. As we said, we see it in so many different situations. I think back to the, the testimony of my mum. Uh, and one of the things that my mum always points to when she's given her testimony uh, is that my mum started to question what happens after we die, after the death of both of her parents. I'm sure you can recount countless different situations and testimonies where a person speaks about how they started to think about things after a tragic event that happened in their lives. We've already seen, I've seen within my own family, uh, about how death and fear and all of these different things that have happened over the past number of months has made people think about eternity. And this is the first challenge that comes to us out of this passage. Joel was called to minister in a time where people were suffering, a time where they didn't know where to turn and thought that their lives were worthless because they'd lost everything that they had. He was called to show them salvation, to show them that the possessions, that the things that they have, that their social status and all of these different things are not important, but to look to something far more important the day of true judgment, and to get right with God. I was constantly reminded of, uh, in, our, in our office where me and Alan work, we have a, uh, a big board up in our staff room where we all have lunch uh, and where we have meetings. Uh, and on this big board, there is a, a, sign, a, a quote just across the top of the board. Uh, and it says just across the top of the board, live for things that have eternal consequences. And it's such a challenge when you think about the time that we've been through, a time when it's so easy to automatically think about ourselves and to think about us and our safety and our situation and to look inward rather than look outward. I don't know if you were one of those people, if you've got, pair, if you've got children or if you're a grandparent, uh, got grandchildren, that you were one of these people that jumped on board with the fitness 
stuff that was going on over the internet during lockdown. And um, I was one of those parents that decided that me and my children were going to get fit during lockdown. And Joe Wicks was doing PE over YouTube every day. So we got on and two minutes in, my kids were sitting on the couch, not bothered. And I'm standing there doing star jumps in the living room with the sweat pouring off my face, trying to show them that it's great fun as I was half dying, lying there on the floor, sweating to death. Um, but one of the things that I noticed, especially watching all these different fitness things that were taking place and stuff like that and all these YouTube videos going on during lockdown is that they were constantly saying that it's so important that you do these things because it's all about looking after you. And it's all about taking time for yourself, thinking of you. This is a time and a situation that we're going through where we are to look after number one and we are to take care of ourselves. That's contrary to what the Bible tells us. That we, especially as Christians, are not to look inwardly. We are not to just look after ourselves and take care of ourselves. But we are to look outwardly. We are to do as Joel done and take each situation as an opportunity to be able to share God's word with others. We are to live for things that have eternal consequences. That's what we're called to do. We've been placed in the place where we are, living in the situation that we are in, to share with dying people the hope of salvation that's been given to us, to show people that possessions don't matter, but we need to live for things that have those eternal consequences and turn to God before it's too late. The challenge that comes from this first point is, have you done that? Jordan, this time of lockdown, Jordan, this time when our friends, our family, our neighbors have been fearful, have been worried about things, have been thinking about eternity, and thinking about those things that have eternal consequences. Have we taken the opportunity to speak to them? Have we taken the opportunity to share online sermons and do different things to be able to help them and encourage them and to show them about the true judgment that is to come? Are we doing that? Do we see the importance of reaching people, especially in the time in which we've been living in? We live in a, in a dying world and we carry the hope of eternal life. It should be a challenge to us all. Are we telling others about it? Or have we become too comfortable in our own lives that we don't feel the urgency to take every opportunity to tell people like Joel did? Now, my last point as we finish is that the day of the Lord is imminent. In Joel chapter two, if we were to read on a little bit further, obviously we just read chapter one as a bit of an introduction this evening, but uh, in Joel chapter two, he repeats that line that he keeps saying, the day of the Lord Instead of telling people that everything will be okay, Joel argues that actually things are going to get worse in our lifetime. While the destruction caused by the locusts would be total and would destroy crops and destroy livelihoods, it would be nothing compared to the final judgment of God. Too much in, in churches today, and we've had the chance, as I said before, to be able to see a lot of different online church services and hear from a lot of different churches, a lot of different denominations and all these different things. And in too many churches today, we hear people softening the message of salvation. We live in a society where we're, we're scared to say anything in case we offend people. So it's easier to just say nothing at all. But the reality is, is that the Bible is offensive. It says things like in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It says in Psalm 14 verse 1, the fool had said in his heart that there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works and there is none that doeth good. And lastly, in Acts 4 verse 12, it says, neither is the salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. When people look at the Bible, they don't like it. And we have had that a lot again during lockdown when I have spoken at different services and there was a youth meeting that I spoke at a little while ago and I got a message um, afterwards, basically just giving me abuse for believing this rubbish and believing that there is a God in the midst of all of this that's going on, in everything that's going on around us, we can have hope and assurance, believing that there's some sort of man in the cloud that looks after us. And I, I got this message on social media about it, because when people hear the Bible and hear the word of God, knowing that God is in control, people are offended by it. People don't like it. Why? Because we see things that are offensive to us. People sometimes come to the Bible looking for encouragement that thinks that it's just a book of positive quotes to make us feel better and then we can carry on with our day. And that to be 
offended when they see the actual reality of what the Bible is. They're looking for something to make them feel good, but instead, what do we find in the Bible? We find a mirror held up to our face, showing us everything that is wrong with our lives. And it hasn't just been Jordan lockdown. As we've traveled around schools, we get a number of different questions. We do a program called Got Questions, and it talks about um, some of the questions that people have about the Bible, and it gives the pupils a chance to ask us questions. And there's been a number of questions that we get asked um, of people trying to trap us and trick us and all these different things. Questions like, if Abraham was a Christian, why did he have so many wives? If David was a Christian, why did he kill Bathsheba's husband and get his wife pregnant? Why would God allow things to happen to us, like death and cancer and all of these different things? Surely he's not a loving God. Surely this isn't a holy book. And we get asked these questions, but the answer never changes. The answer is still the same. The thing to remember about the Bible is that the Bible isn't a book about good people showing us how to be good. The Bible is about God saving bad people, saving broken people, saving people from themselves and the entrapment of sin that we have got ourselves into. We realize when we look at the Bible that the people in it are just like us, sinful people who God has graciously and lovingly saved. When the restoration comes, they'll know that God is in the midst and that he alone is the source of their strength and their power and their blessing. They'll set their hearts to follow him and they will never have been drawn back. That is the promise that God gives to his people in this book. The same promise that he offers to all who trust in him today. And that was the message of Joel. Joel, in the midst of such a hard time, when it is so easy for us to just keep quiet and say nothing, in the midst of a time of fear, in the midst of a time of panic, in the midst of an age of social media where people can so readily just give us abuse for what we believe. We see someone like Joel And we see that in the midst of a troubling time that he faced, he told people about God, irrespective of what the consequences were going to be. That was the message of Joel. He was called, just like God calls us today, to preach about life to a dying world and tell them about the final return of Christ. It's not too late. It's not too late to save our churches. There's still time to save the next generation. There's still time to turn this nation back to God. But we can't do it. We can't do it on our own. We need a divine intervention. We need God to move amongst his people. We need revival. We need divine invasion of our lives and our church and our society. And the challenge to us is that if we're going to see revival, we need to go, we need to change our ways. We need to look at our lives. We need to look at the gifts and the talents and the abilities that God has given us and ask ourselves, are we using it for God's glory? Are we doing all that we can while we can to serve God in the situation that he has put us in? We need to change our ways. We need to get back to God. That's why we spend time in meetings such as this, in prayer meetings, coming to God on our knees, praying to him, asking for him to intervene and for him to save souls. We speak about all the things that we do as LMI, and all of these different things that we've been able to do, all these people that we've been able to help, and all these relief efforts, we don't do nothing. But we wait upon God. We pray. We look to God for help, for strength, and for opportunities to be able to serve him as best that we can, as weak vessels that he gives us, the gifts and the talents and the abilities, but it is all done through him and by him and not by us. And that's what we do in this prayer meeting, is that we pray in order for God to hear our prayers and to move and to heal our land and to bless the people and to graciously save souls the same as he has saved us. The warning that we see as I finish just here in Romans 13, verse 11 to 14, is just as urgent today as it was then. It says in Romans 13, 11 to 14, it says, and that knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. 
It was so easy over the last number of months for us to look at ourselves, look at our own situation, look at what we were going through. But yet, as I said, as we look back now, seeing in hindsight, we see how God moved. We see how God worked. And we see how God is continuing to do that. And we should be thankful and blessed as a church that God continues to choose to use us to fulfill his plans and purposes here on earth. We come to our time of prayer now looking to seek God's face and to seek his will and to seek his discernment on our church and on our lives as individuals. We pray looking for God to move because we can do nothing without him. We need to be a people and we need to be a church that strive to pray that God will grant us opportunities to serve him so that he may be glorified in the midst of the situation that we are in and in the midst of every situation that we get the opportunity to preach his name in. We need to be like Joel, that no matter what is going on, no matter what we are going through, that we tell people about God because nothing that we can go through is going to be as big as that final judgment. And we want to be able to tell people about how they can be saved from it and have a loving God that offers that free gift of salvation to anyone that calls and asks upon his name. Now, we're going to have a very brief time of prayer. Um, I'm going to open in prayer and then uh, please pray as the Lord has, has led you. Um, please pray for those who are sick in the church. Please pray uh, for the Sunday services. They go ahead. There's many ministers in our denomination um, that are obviously um, away at the moment, that are on holidays. Um, so please do pray for them that they'll be refreshed. Um, I know as somebody, as Alan said before, as somebody that makes a lot of videos uh, and does a lot of media stuff for our organization, it is very, very difficult. And I would take preaching in a pulpit any day over having to preach at a camera and then do editing and all the rest of the stuff that goes with it. So it has been a, a, a hard number of months for a lot of ministers, um, as I well know. Um, so please do pray that they'll be refreshed during their time of being away. And then please do remember uh, the work that Alan shared as well and the prayer points that are there behind us. So let's pray. Lord, did you thank you for the salvation that you have given to us, Lord? Did you thank you that you offer this salvation so great and so free, Lord? Did you thank you that as we remember what you gave for us, Lord, did you just stand here in awe of what you've done for us, Lord? And we do just come to you this evening, Lord, to praise you and to thank you, Lord, for that love that you laid upon us, Lord, that love that drew salvation's plan and the grace that brought it down to man and the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary, Lord. We do just thank you, Lord, that you poured that love out upon us, Lord. We're not deserving of it, but we do thank you, Lord, that you have poured out that love on us anyway, Lord, that you have given us your grace and your mercy and your love. And we do thank you, Lord, that you have not only saved us, but you choose to use us, Lord. And we do just pray that as we have read of this book of Joel uh, and the work that Joel's done for you in the midst of such a hard and fearful time, Lord, we do just pray that you will continue to grant us opportunities as individuals and as a church to serve you, to tell people of that salvation, Lord, so that they may know of that final judgment, that they may know of their sin and that they may come to trust in you as their own and personal saviour. Please give us boldness. Please help us and guide us as we seek out those opportunities to serve you, Lord, and help us to serve you effectively, Lord. We know that we may not always have the right words to say, but we do just pray, Lord, that you will just help us to be bold in speaking the things of you to others. We do just thank you for what we have heard this evening, Lord, and for the the missionary work, Lord. Uh, we do thank you for LMI and we do thank you for everything uh, that you enable us to do, Lord, all of these different relief efforts. And we do just pray that you'll continue to bless those in different countries who don't have the healthcare system that we have, that don't have the clean water that we have and all of these different things, Lord. We do just pray that you'll continue to put your hands upon them, Lord, that you'll put your hand upon those who are preaching the gospel in those places, that you'll continue to help them. Be with us and help us and draw us closer to you this evening, Lord, we ask in your name.